All right, I think I'm live. Hi, I'm Cliff Click. Uh, I'm here to talk about under the hood and the Java virtual machine. So I was a JVM engineer for more than 15 years. <clears throat> um, I'm still amazed at what's in a JVM. Um, there's a huge count of services um, that have just sort of increased slowly over time. And, and many of the services are sort of painfully volunteered by sort of very naive changes in the spec. You know, finalizers and what the hell I did to garbage collection was just awful. Um, and, and there's a, lots of these things that were, you know, somebody had a cool idea and they changed the language and the impact in the JVM was like enormous. So if you look at a JVM and what goes on, you find a bunch of interesting parts. You know, the, 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 the sum of the parts is greater, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, but the parts themselves are interesting. So it's a high quality GC. So parallel concurrent, uh, 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 you know, incremental collectors with, you know, reasonably good uh, low total allocation cost. When Java started, that was just not possible. And now it's sort of assumed. Um, high quality machine code generation um, is something I had a very personal hand in. Um, that was, again, a thing that no one believed you could do at runtime. Uh, and now it's just assumed that the code quality comes out, matches what you get out of a standard you know, static compiler at dash O2 level, um, including profiled code and all the code management goes with it. Um, and the, and the, the thing under there that says bytecode cost model, that is a key uh, a thing that the JIT brings in. I'll talk more about that later. Um, there's a uniform threading and memory model. Um, and again, that was not a thing that was possible when Java started. And so Java sort of did something new there, broke some ground and said, this is what it means to have threads communicate across all kinds of different hardware. You know, of course, type safety of, of uh, all kinds of ways. Um, dynamic code loading, you don't have to have the closed world assumption. You can keep adding code and it all just works. Um, high quality, quick time access, uh, uh, lots of internal introspective services, this huge library that made Java, you know, one of the, one of the key building blocks for Java was that you got access to the, the, the JDK and the concurrent collections and all kinds of collections. Um, access to the OS level, uh, 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 you know, things that the OS normally provides are brought through the JVM, so you can get threads and scheduling, uh, priorities, and of course, native code. Um, where did all these services come from, and you know, why are they there? So, so they're mostly incrementally added over time. The language, the JVM, and the hardware have all co-evolved together. Um, you know, like 64-bit math didn't start when Java started because you didn't have 64-bit processors. Um, support for high core count machines was not in there in the beginning because you didn't have them, and so on and so forth. So why did these services show up? It's because the services provide an illusion, and those illusions are this powerful abstraction. It's the V in virtual machine. It's this great abstraction. You can think about solving other problems somewhere else and know that you have this illusion that, that works to cover up for all kinds of complexity elsewhere. It's a separation of concerns. JVM does this problem, you solve that problem. So I'm going to talk today about what kind of services are in a JVM um, and sort of where they came from a little bit and what they do for you and then whether or not they do a good job and what can be done better about it. In particular, many of the services will overlap with existing OS services, but they have some sort of different requirement going on that doesn't exactly match. You can't just lean on the OS resource to make that happen. And then there's some you know, easy changes that we'd like to see make, uh, made that would make uh, JVMs work better. So look, let me look first at illusions that we have. When I say we have, I mean they, they actually work. So garbage collection is the illusion of infinite memory. You just allocate and allocate and allocate and allocate. You're never free, right? You don't track lifetimes. And that works because GC figures out what's live and what's dead. And this is vastly easier to use than malloc and free model and fewer bugs and quicker time to market and all that goes with it. It enables certain classes of concurrent algorithms that you simply cannot do with malloc and free because you cannot track lifetimes. And GCs have made these huge strides in the last 15 years. They are obviously production ready, been that way for quite a while now, robust, parallel, concurrent. Um, there's still a major pain point for many users. Um, too many GC tuning flags, too many issues with GC pauses. There's lots of you know, active differentiation going on in the different kinds of GCs that are available. I'm going to mention three right here. You'll see pause times vary over you know, six orders of magnitude. Um, the, the Azul's pauseless GC has actually gotten substantially better than one millisecond max pause time. These are max pause times, by the way. Um, 
but you have to go to not custom hardware, but almost a custom setup, because you can't get down below a millisecond without involving all kinds of other features of the OS, because it's not just the JVM, it's not just GC, to get rid of all the pauses. Whereas the, the stock, a standard full GC is very efficient, very high throughput, but if you get into tens of gigs of heap, you can get tens of seconds of pause time, and that's just not acceptable in some situations. Another illusion we have is that bytecodes are fast. In fact, bytecodes are this really lousy way to describe program semantics. There's all kind of better descriptions for how to you know, choose to describe program semantics, but we're stuck with bytecodes, fine. The main win, of course, is that bytecodes hide CPU details. They're talking about some sort of language semantics, but you don't actually talk about machine registers or cores or the speeds of loads and stores and multiplies or whatever the hell it is. Um, but it's all a big illusion, because if you interpret the bytecodes because of their complicated semantics, the interpretation is slow. And the JIT bring back, brings back an expected cost model. The, the cost model is that the, the things that look like a load and store turn into a load and store eventually. And it's because of that that you can reason about the speed of programs. You understand where the time goes, or you can you know, reach a point you understand where the time goes. And that lets you write high performance code. And that was one of the reasons that Java was able to take off, is it was able to match C performance at sort of close enough level. And that was only possible with the, bike, with the cost model that came out of the JVM. To make that happen, the JVM had to mimic the, the performance, the, the optimizations that were done by the C compilers. So JVM, the, the JIT inside, brings out to you know, everyone in this room essentially GCC-02 level of optimization without you ever thinking about it or realizing it's happening. And why didn't we use GCC directly or any number of open source, readily available compilers at that era? It's because they didn't do the right job everywhere. They missed on certain key places. They didn't track pointers for garbage collection. They didn't follow the Java memory model, which has very strong restrictions on when you can reorder. The reordering, they all did. Everyone will re reschedule loads and stores for performance reasons. But in the case of Java memory model, there are times when you can and times when you cannot. And, and you simply have to, to track those through. And that's just sort of woven throughout. Another thing that happened is there were different patterns of code to optimize. Java has implicit semantics for range checks. C does not. That, in turn, means you do aggressive range check elimination. When that was done, Java array access has become, on average, the same speed as a C array access. And that was one of the performance guarantees that came about that wasn't possible when the, Java, uh, when the JVM started. Um, the Java, the jitting goes on, uh, requires profiling because you can't compile everything. And, but the profiling has a bunch of extra benefits in that you get focused code generation and sh actually better code generation. It's the same as doing profiled code to everyone in the room. When I started the JVM, code you know, optimizing with profiling code was only done by vendors trying to get the latest, greatest spec whatever benchmarks out, and the, the profiling definitely had a large improvement in speed, but it's too cumbersome to use for everyday use. Um, bringing it into the JVM, let us do it on the fly, every time, everywhere, and it brings all these benefits in terms of performance. You now just accept it as a normal, hey, job is fast kind of thing. Another major speed issue that came around was virtual calls. This is an illusion that virtual calls are fast. In the land of C++, of course, you have virtual calls, but they're slow. So you have to ask for them by saying this is virtual. And then you don't ask for them very often, and so it's slow, and there's no point in optimizing them. They're just not present. In Java, it's the other way around. You get it by default. They're all virtual, except when you didn't actually overload. Um, so what do you do about it? Well, you have to make it fast by default. And it turns out that you mostly can. So uh, JVM does some class hierarchy analysis, discovers there are no callers except the one. Um, so you get a static call out of virtual call. Sometimes you get a new class loaded and you, that was a mistake and you have to reject. Okay, fine, you do. And if that doesn't work, you sometimes discover, or you mostly discover that call sites go to only one target and you use an inline cache. And again, it brings the speed back down to a static call. And eventually, if all that fails, you do an actual virtual call, the same as C++ does every time. So the cost comes back down to uh, uh, the same cost as a static call if your behavior is like a static call, and a virtual call if not, and you never had to think about it. But it was the illusion that the virtual calls are fast becomes a reality. Um, another thing that the C folks could ever do was load partial programs. They always had to have the whole world 
assumption come along, and that usually happened to link step, but sometimes for performance reasons you did it earlier, and then your co compilation cost like went through the roof. In Java, you can just load code on the fly every time, and it's going to get compiled on the spot when it needed and become as fast as the original code in the original program, you know, the start piece you started with. It may require you to unwind some optimizations and reprofile and recompile, and that just happens. And so the illusion is you can incrementally build up your program. Every like frickin' Java J2EE server does that. They pull in more code and pull in more code, pull in more code and run it, run it, run it. And if you run it a bunch, it, it gets fast and it's all good. Um, another thing that happens here is that there's a consistent memory model, so you can reason about parallel programs. All the machines, all the pieces of hardware out there um, have very different memory models, and it turns out that they, they not only vary fairly widely from machine to machine, but within generations of the same machine. And we all think, hey, x86 has got this very conservative memory model. Well, the real answer is that, that if you roll back 10 years ago, it didn't have one at all. And the memory model depended on what the uh, motherboard vendor did and how they communicated between chips. So you had to get, you know, the, the JVM had to deal with compact motherboards versus, you know, deck alpha motherboards versus whatever, and they did different things. Um, some other chips that people use commonly have, you know, much more aggressive memory models than, you know, the x86 one. So ARM is probably very uh, well known today. But, you know, I've worked on a bunch of varieties of hardware where people had very aggressive memory models. The real short story is they're all different. None of them match the Java memory model semantics, so the, JMM, the JVM has to do that. And the JVM does that by, let me see if I have the next slide on that one. Yeah, the JVM bridges the gap, but it has to do it by keeping cost model cheap. So loads and stores have to remain fast, so you understand where the speed goes. But with a combination of you know, right kind of memory fences and code scheduling and placements of locks and the right kind of things, you can get back both performance and a well-understood memory model of how the threads communicate. Requires detailed knowledge of the hardware, requires close cooperation from the JET. It's not something you can just like patch in afterwards in somebody else's compiler. There's a consistent threading model. And again, this was very different you know, back in the day. It wasn't Linux everywhere. There was AIX and Solaris and a dozen, dozen other OSs. Um, but even these days, you get Windows and you get whatever runs on your phone. Pick your you know, OS of choice. And Java will cover up the differences in the OS's threading model. So anywhere from you know, small devices to 1,000 core machines, synchronize, wait, notify, join, they all just work. And they work efficiently. They work well. So that's one of the keys. It's not just they work. But, but if you have a, you know, 100,000 runnables pile in on some stupid lock and they're all waiting for a notify, you don't get 100,000 things woken up and all try to run and all go back to sleep and whatever it takes. You actually have efficient, good, you know, reasonably fair locking properties. And that is the JVM covering up for the sins of the OS. So that brings around to locks. So locks are fast. Well, obviously, if you contend on a lock, you're not fast. And you have to block and go in the OS. And you would like to get a fairness from the OS, but it turns out that every OS I've ever worked on uh, does not provide fairness on locks. That if you have 10 things or 100 threads maybe, it's reasonably fair. If you have 100,000 threads piling on a lock, somebody starves indefinitely. It never runs. And so the, oh, the JVM has to not rely on the OS for all the properties of locks. It has to do something else when the count of locks get big enough. But people do locks a lot. So they get optimized, and they have to run fast. So bias locking is just a handful of clocks when it works, but you get very fast user mode locks in pretty much all situations. And why is this happening? Well, it's because people still don't know how to program concurrently. I did this talk five years ago. That statement, I believe, is still true. We don't know how it works. So you get in this mode where you just add a lock to fix your bugs till the bug goes away, right? And you get a lot of junk locks. Eh, OK, fine. Um, Locks are common, they execute all the time, they have to be optimized, they were optimizable. You get this particular concurrent programming style of I'm locking around every possible thing, um, but it mostly kind of works. We've learned a lot about concurrent programming as a result, and there are some better answers out there, but I don't think there's a real clear winning solution. It is still commonly the case that synchronized keywords show up, and they show up a lot. Quick time access, system.curt time millis. Why do I care? Well, when I first started in the land of, you know, Hotspot and Java virtual machines, there were all these benchmarks. There's one in particular um, that would call current time millis billions of times a second. 
So count the billions per second. It's not running on one core because you can't run billions per second 10, 15 years ago. But across a large, you know, big shared memory multiprocessor server, you would get billions of calls a second. Um, it is still fairly common in nearly all large apps. And that funny line in the middle, real Java programs really expect this. What the hell does that mean? It says if some thread called current time millis and got one milli off from some other thread who called current time millis, then thread one makes an implicit assumption that there's a happens before relationship between, between the two threads. That is to say, if thread one loads a current time millis and loads a value from memory, and thread two loads the current time millis, and they compare them, and they're off by one, then thread two knows that his load comes after the first guy within the clock cycle. Like clock cycle by clock cycle, not millisecond by millisecond. I'm talking clock cycle by clock cycle. That is a really hard invariant to maintain because, you know, it, it's, it's thousand milliseconds. There's a million milliseconds before you have a nano, and that's roughly the, the, the timing that these loads are happening on. But still, if you don't follow this property, real job applications then crash because they get things out of order. They assume that because I saw this millisecond was less than yours, that my transaction was completed before yours began. That's not true, then you die. Um, and we tried a couple different ways and we discovered that you must actually have this property. So up until about 2012, if you went on an x86 and you grabbed the DSC register, which is the tick counting register for doing high accuracy time, it was actually not coherent across the cores. It was definitely not coherent across sockets in a, in a motherboard, but even on one chip, you'd have some processors that were being idle, they would tick slower to a low power mode, and then the counts of the nanos in there would all vary from another core, which is running fast. And so if a thread jumped from a busy core to an idle core, his current time millis would run backwards because the TSC register was ticking differently, right? You couldn't do it. So it was a real mess. Um, uh, in fact, it led to like a, this magical flag called dash XX colon plus aggressive optimization, which said, hey, we're going to cheat on time and know that this app won't crash, but we're going to use a TC register even though it's not monotonic. And you couldn't use that flag if you were running, you know, JBoss or WebSphere because you would crash. But if you're running this mag magical, you know, J app server, whatever the benchmark was, it worked and you got a lot faster because you could grab the TSC register and do something with it. And this led to the notion of, well, isn't there a better way to get time? And of course there is, and all I need is a, a plain load updated by a background thread by the Linux kernel. You know, a thousand times a second, Linux kernel suggests flip a page, a counter in a page, and everyone can just read it. It would be you know, atomically correct down to the clock cycle across all the cores. Um, we played with it for a while, 10% speed up on that key benchmark, um, whatever. So then, you know, along came hypervisors and VMware, and people love to play hypervisor games, and we discovered that um, because the TSC register sucked so bad that the hypervisor people wanted to help. And so they jumped in and said, we'll intercept the TSC register load, and we'll make it uniform, monotonically ticking, do everything you want out of a good time register, except because we jumped in and intercepted it, it got 1,000, well, 100 times slower. And of course, if you're calling something a billion times a second and it gets 100 times slower, you notice it. So that was not helpful. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about some illusions that people hope to have or thought they had that actually aren't present um, and that maybe you wish you might have had. So, the, you know, the illusion of the infinite stacks, so of tail recursion. Um, there are some functional languages that would love to have tail recursion. It's not in the JVM now. It's not actually that hard to put in. I kind of thought it would have come in years ago, but I bailed out of this game, so um, it's up to Oracle now, right? Um, closures, you know, running code as data. Um, again, if you have sort of JVM level internal actual support for closures, you can do things. Instead, Java has these you know, thunks that aren't quite really closures. And so you kind of sort of kind of get to first class functions, but not really. And you get really close. Um, you know, Lambda helps a lot, uh, but it's not all the way there. And so various people like swear at the JVM for not actually providing real closures. Um, Big I integer is as cheap as int and autoboxing optimizations. So, so the magical badness about capital I integer and autoboxing is it silently autoboxes if you make a mistake. And then if you autobox, what happens is that you allocate for every time you make an int 
and then the allocation misses in cash 100% of the time, guaranteed. Furthermore, because as a final, it has to have a, a, a memory fence even on an x86. And then because you have a bunch of these capillators running around, they all alias with each other, and so the, the JIT can't reorder them or hoist them into registers. And so suddenly you get like this massive slowdown in some piece of code, plus a huge pile of allocation, plus you burned a lot of memory bandwidth, and things got a lot slower, and, and it was like, what did I do? I, I turned a little eye into a big eye by accident. It's like, whoa, what happened here? Um, you know, if we had better auto-boxing optimizations, that would get better. But I think actually there's a language fail there where you can't say, this code is performance sensitive. Let me know if I'm auto-boxing. Um, and that kind of brings us around to the big integer thing. You know, JavaScript has this notion of all ints are infinitely sized. And what it really means is that when you overflow from a small int, you have to switch to some complicated structure. But most people don't ever actually overflow. And so I think Java here has got it right, although we might want to have, you know, silent overflow to big integer. Um, you can't do it performantly without help from the JIT directly, or else it's a language visible feature, and then you have to ask for it. And so in Java, you ask for it. In JavaScript, you suffer, everyone suffers little int uh, accidentally being able to flip to big int, and then they have to deal with all extra tests and whatnot to check for that. Yeah. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the ways that you might hope to get better with concurrent programming is to have something with, you have a, a, some sort of atomic multi-address update. Uh, unfortunately, you know, that's never really panned out. In, in practice, just now, some of the hardware chips have ability to do more than one word atomically updated, um, but there's no language level support for it. People tried software transactional memory for many years to give an illusion of it in software, and the answer, of course, is that it's much too fragile. It never actually worked. Yeah. Um, invoke dynamic, I think, is actually here now. And when I say here, I mean it's here in a performant enough way that you could actually use it. Um, I think that, that when I wrote this talk, you know, five or six years ago, um, invoke dynamic was this concept, but it wasn't performant to the point where it was worth screwing with, right? OK, um, what's going on here? Well, there's this giant mass of code. It's been approaching nearly 20 years old. Um, even though I've been out of the game for a while, it's very clear, given the rate of change, that it still has issues where large chunks of the code are fragile, or so I want to say very fluffy per line of code. If there's too much crud to make good forward progress. Um, I will give you know, Oracle and Brian Gretz kudos for trying very hard and making some progress, but it's clear that there's issues at adding a lot of the features that you might want to add. Um, here's another illusion that we like to have or think we have, and that's thread priorities. Mostly on Linux, you don't have them. You, you, you do, but you have to be root. And of course, no one wants to run their application as root in, in production, so you're not running as root. So all you can do is lower your priority, you can't raise it. Um, and that means that you can make a thread sort of commit suicide, but he can't demand that this thread is important. So for instance, if you have a concurrent GC, you have to have a concurrent GC thread run if it's going to be concurrent. If you have all your threads being mutator threads and they're all running full blast, the concurrent threads are not running. Well, then they don't catch up and then you get a GC pause. Or it, you do that, but you fix that by raising their priority. But you end up raising it on the entire box because you can't raise it per process. And that means that a low priority JVM doing some batch work with burning all the cores has some high priority threads doing concurrent GC. They're gonna starve out some other JVM because they've got high priority threads that are running. Yeah. Write once, run anywhere, kind of, sort of works. But scale matters. What you do for programs that are very small or very large or very different. And so you have to think about the problems in a different way. It's not the case that the program's just up and run everywhere. Finalizers. What a great concept. What a horrible, I don't know what, actual usage case. Because they have no timeliness guarantees in when they run, eventually finalizers run. But eventually might be never. There was a situation where Tomcat did finalizers for closing file handles for doing uh, uh, you know, web service work. They had a very high turnover rate on thread requests. They got a file handle per each one. You get a full GC cycle periodically, your file handles all came back. But then heaps got bigger. And full GC times got further apart and further apart. And suddenly you ran out of OS file handles. And then your, your, you know, your Tomcat would crash until a full GC cycle. And that was such an egregious situation that we ended up doing a callback from the file handle, I didn't get one from the OS, into the GC to demand a full GC cycle, even though there was plenty of heap spare, in order to get finalizers to run. And then you went back and asked again the OS, can I have a file handle now? 
right? And this is like a, a this is like a completely it's the wrong way to deal with OS level resources. There was no timeliness guarantees in when those resources came back. So file handles, okay, but you're going to do it with you know bit buffers on your on your video games and your screens like this. How about native byte buffers? How about I mean I can name like 27 more in a row. So this is not the right way to handle OS resources. And finalizers put this huge burden on the GC. How about soft phantom weak refs? They're using essentially asking the GC to manage a cache. The problem is, is the GC has no idea why your cache exists and what it's trying to cache. So this situation would occur. You have a server that's running, and you ramp up load on the server, and the load gets higher and higher, and the server is working well and caching. The cache is working because that's what caches are supposed to do, and it's caching most requests, and it's very efficient and has a high throughput rate. And then you bobble up just a little bit more load, and you get a GC cycle. And the GC cycle flushes some refs out of the cache. And then when you go back to the cache, it's empty, so you miss. So you have to do the work to rebuild the thing in the cache. Well, that requires a lot of allocation to do that work. So you did that allocation, but you were low on memory. So pretty quickly, you get another GC cycle, and you flush some more things out of your cache. And you get this vicious cycle where you're constantly flushing your cache, and you can't ever get it full. So the server has to keep doing all the work to fill the cache, but it keeps getting flushed out from under it. And you get this crash in throughput on the server. And it stays crashed until you kill the load. And then you can add the load, and it'll ramp back up and be high performing again. And that's because GC has no freaking clue what your cache is trying to do or what this soft ref is related to a cache or anything like that. There's no way for it to understand your application level caching needs. So this is like a great idea, sounds like fun. We'll have the GC handle your, your caching behavior and throw things away out of the cache when we need to reclaim memory, but it doesn't understand the load requirements that are going on and it can't, you know, it, it has no feedback mechanism. So in, in practice, it leads to a, actually uh, under load, a very fragile situation. OK. So I'm going to walk down through the illusions and do different things with them. So here are some services that the, J, the JVM provides. Right? GC, uh, we all love GC. Jitting, OK, that's great. Java memory model, so it's woven throughout the GC, the jitting, the VM itself. Thread management, some sort of fast time access. Hiding CPU de details and hardware memory model, those go into like having a, a, you know, a, a cost model for execution plus the communication model between threats. There are some services provided below the JVM, the OS layer, so threats, context switching, thread priorities, IO, file access, virtual memory protection, there's a bunch of those. There's a bunch of services that are above the JVM that are pretty common. People lean on thread pools very commonly. Workless, transactional behavior somehow, right? Crypto caching layers, uh, models of concurrent programming that are not just threads and locks maybe. Alternative languages want new dispatch rules, want maybe big integer, they have alternative concurrency models, maybe it's an Erlang or an actor style. There's a bunch of different uh, services you might provide uh, above a JVM. Whoop. Back here. So here's, a, here's a, a service that I think belongs in the OS. The JVM should provide or needs to provide a fast quality time. And you get fast but not quality from TSC up until recently. And then you have to actually have some custom code still because you can get context switch on threads. And it's not actually, it's not actually there yet. Um, quality not fast from OS get time of day. It's pretty good. But if your benchmark runs at a billion times a second, it can be faster. It can be faster by a lot. All you have to do is have a memory page where you tick a word on a kernel interrupt, you know, on a time interrupt. Um, everyone will get a cache coherent to the clock cycle updated version of time for no more than a load. Thread priorities. OS already provides thread priorities at the process level, but we want thread priorities within a process because the JVM has to have some threads with higher priority than the mutator threads. The GC has to have cycles to catch up with the garbage being produced by the mutator threads, or if it starves, you run out of heap, and you take a pause. And the whole point of doing you know, one of these low-pause collectors is to not take a pause. So that doesn't work unless you can define a thread priority on the, mutator, on the GC thread that's higher than the mutators. Same thing happens to the JIT. If you run 1,000 threads and they're all busy doing some work, and the JIT gets starved, then those 1,000 threads only ever run interpreted. They never get JITted. And I have totally seen that happen. So you have to have thread priorities for the JIT as well. When I was out of Zool, we ended up faking thread priorities with a duty style locks and blocks. We just had to do it, or we weren't going to get a low pause concurrent collector. Um, 
And this is just something that just belongs in the OS. He's already doing process priorities, and he's already running managing threads. He should do priorities on threads. Um, the current Linux situation is that you can't raise your priority without being root, which is fine if it wasn't the case that everyone starts out at max, unless you're root. It should be that if everyone started out at some middle end level and then you could raise voluntarily without being root, this problem would go away. Um, alternative concurrency models. So the JVM does provide you with thread management. You can make 100,000 runnables and they'll work and they'll have you know, reasonable performance. I mean, it provides you very fast locking. Okay, that's great. But that's like a, you know, the thread and lock model of concurrency programs sort of like a similar language for concurrency. There's gotta be a better way. So there's actors, there's message passing models, the software transaction on memory, you know, the, the fork join model, the streaming thing. Th these are all new ideas about concurrency, about how to think about concurrency, for which the JVM itself is just too big and cumbersome to move fast here, and we really need to do exploratory work um, above the JVM level. All right, until maybe we get some consensus on what the right way to do concurrency is, and then the JVM might provide some building blocks. So for instance, a fast park and unpark, or some specific kind of software transactional memory that maybe overlays you know, the new Intel you know, hardware transactional memory, something like that. Fixed nums. Some people love them, some people hate them. Um, they're actually best implemented in the JVM because the JVM can jit out special instructions to check for overflow math. There are special instructions on all the hardware chips to do overflow math. They're not jitted out now because the JVM doesn't understand that you're trying to do big integer math because it's not the default case that everything might overflow. If we had some support for, for you know, overflowing integer math inside the JVM, you could get out high quality jitted code and it would have roughly the same cost as a small int all the time, unless you flipped over to the big int, and then you, of course, you're a big int math now. Um, so one of those things, though, where mostly people know that they fit in 64 bits, so they can just ask for a long, and that's going to be very efficient. And if they know that they're not going to fit in a long, they, people know that, and then you can just ask for it. But don't ask for it by default, which is what JavaScript does. Um, the GC, jitting, and Java memory model and type safety are all strongly tied together. And this sort of defines what the JVM does. Um, you have to have, you know, GC has deep hooks into the jitting process to know when and where safe points go in, when and where read barriers and white barriers go in, how to optimize them. Um, the Java memory model also has deep hooks into the jitting process and into the JVM proper to know when threads are allowed to talk when they're not running in jitted code. Um, there's some chance that you get these alternative concurrency models that would allow you to get away with a weaker memory model, but that is still going to require close cooperation from the JET. So I, I argue that these things taken together as a whole basically define the core guts of the Java virtual machine, and that, that is the definition of it. Um, OS resource lifetime. I think these should be moved out of, well, GC, out of finalizers, that people should do it themselves. And this is what, you know, try with resources is all about is, it, you know, stack based allocation of OS level resources basically works. And when it doesn't, you might want to go to reference counting or some sort of arena level management. But the GC is like a, a really bad place to say, you know, go manage this resource for me. And when it's next convenient to run a full GC cycle, clean it up because it might never be next convenient if you have the right kind of collector, right? Um, same thing for weeks off phantom refs. They were intentionally originally designed to help people with caches for which they didn't want to keep something alive only because it was in the cache. But again, the GC doesn't know the meaning of your cache or why it exists or that it is a cache even. And so it, it's a really lousy heuristic for defining when you should throw something out of the cache and when it should not. There's a better way to go here, um, but you don't have the GC you know, change your application semantics. Okay, so quick summary here. The JVM currently gives you thread priorities, fast time, and OS resource management via finalizers, and I think these things should move out, either down the OS or up to the application level. Fixed nums, tail calls, and closures, I think, should go into JVM, and that would enable a bunch of different kinds of language features um, of, of you know, various people have argued or asked for for a long time. Um, it turns out that GBGC is, uh, you know, I hate to say it, Oracle, but like just you know, fess up, it's nowhere close the G1 is nowhere close to GBGC. It's a truly better allocator by a lot. Um, it needs a little bit of OS work that is now in the kernel, and you know, 
this should be moved into the Oracle land. But in this case, um, what really happened here is I got a TLB user mode process, so this piece happened already. Um, hardware performance counters. This was sort of Intel screwing up a few more times, and that that required, you know, privileged access to get out the counters but you want to have a user mode process, the JVM, not only get at the counters, but actually probably JIT code that it automatically reads them on the fly so that you can do sort of fine-grained counter analysis. Um, it's a natural consumer of hardware performance counters. There's all kinds of fun stuff I can and have done with hardware performance counters, um, but Intel made it actually hard to get at them. Fine. With, those, with that kind of information, the JIT and the JVM is a natural place to map that stuff back into the Java level. So you have all the performance counters, you have a mapping internal inside the JVM so that you know what to inline and what not, and what to optimize and where the best places to go. That information should be brought out as standard performance information for you know, IntelliJ, your kit, whoever is gonna run a profiler. And it's not, and it doesn't make any sense. It really should be brought out. This, this is a thing that, that uh, you know, the, the information, the JVM has the mapping, it should bring it out and let people see what's going on there. OK, so I claim these things ought to happen, um, and they can't currently for one reason or another. And OK, doom. And I'm done. That was, that was Cliff running through 35 minutes fast as I can. <laughs> so there's time for questions. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what the hell is this thing? So I am um, I'm looking for people cheating in the stock market. I am using big data and machine learning to analyze stock trade activity to look for fraud. Um, lots. <laughs> um, there are various... Uh, uh, Governmental requirements for looking for fraud internal to companies, for trading firms, for exchanges, for clearing houses, um, and, and we have sort of the obvious better answer by a long shot over you know what is currently sort of common practice. Uh, we also have been working closely with various kinds of regulatory agencies uh, on actual real life court cases because we're able to find and pull out things that no one else is doing, um, and and and, uh, and people who who might be on the wrong side of the regulatory inquiries also want to know what we're finding. So it's an interesting business use case. <laughs> and it's written in Java, yes. So it, it's, it's H2O, my last project, uh, uh, done to a financial vertical. Running on Azul or a... No, no, running on stock hardware. So it's H2O runs on stock hardware. So we use the full GC, the standard old school collector, works great with H2O and big data. So no G1. No CMS, no GPGC, just stock collector. And we get fantastic performance out of it because we've ranged the data that worked that way. And then another fun performance hack. Most of my data is stored in big fat byte arrays. There's not very many, there's a lot of data, but not many objects. And the old school collector like really goes really well with that. Uh, it is my opinion that Oracle would have to try really hard to remove it because they just shoot themselves in the foot. It's all uh, like being the default for so long, like so many people are going to be so wedded to its exact performance characteristics that they're never going to be able to turn it off for a long time. Until they have a truly better answer that's uniformly across the board better, I don't think they're going to be able to turn it off. So I think, it'll, it, I think it will remain supported for a long time, or it's my belief that they'd be uh, you know, business-wise foolish to, to stop supporting it. It's also going to have a very low maintenance cost, because it's alive and well forever and a day. Um, if you don't do anything, it's just going to keep working. Not that I'm going to speak for you know, Brian Getz and Oracle about what they end up doing, but... Yeah. Right. So, is there any work on MemMap and friends? Is that what I just heard you ask? 
Um, so I don't know. So I have been out of the Oracle arena for a while. Um, you have to ask, you know, Brian Getz and company. Um, it's my understanding that as of the last re two releases ago, maybe, there was a big push to get MMAP to behave better. Um, and that that's the, currently the state that there's more reasonable things you can do with it. You can unmap. And you can, uh, uh, I don't know about the two gig limit. That, that's a different one. You're asking about memcached. Yeah, I ended up doing my own caching in Java heap. And so I don't have memcached. I don't have memmap issues. Um, but but pe plenty of people do memcached and then they want to know how that works. As far as I know, you can now do more things with it. I, but I'm the wrong guy to ask for that one. Okay, so I see a lot of people hanging around, hoping there's another interesting conversation get started. <laughs> For that to happen, you have to actually like speak up. Have you been following Graal VM and the stuff they do, like writing Hotspot in Java? Yeah. So I've talked with the Graal guys a fair amount. Um, they're in a funny situation where they've been sort of you know behind the curve and playing catch up for a long time. And for some set of interesting benchmarks, they finally caught up. Um, for some other you know, benchmarks, they, they clearly are not. And then there is a domain where you have a, a mixed Java and non-Java, like C native code, where they can cross the boundary at, at no cost um, and even optimize across it that they're well ahead on. So they, they've reached a point now where I think the, the implementation has some interesting properties where you might want to use it um, if, you're, if you fall in the domain where it's clearly better. But if it's not in that domain where it's clearly better, it's pretty questionable because you're going to pick up a new technology which is going to have a lot of you know, uncompleted, unfinished warts that you have to deal with. Um, but if you're experimenting on a new application and you understand you might get to the zone where you're going to cross the, the native code boundary a fair amount, or you're mixing you know, Python, actual Python, not Jython, with you know, the, the Java code or whatever, um, yeah, I, I'd take a look at it. There, there's something there. It, you know, I, one of my comments here was that the JVM's been around forever and a day, and a lot of that code is fluffy. Um, I did a lot of rip and replace at Azul, and I got a lot of mileage out of it. Um, you know, Graal is essentially rip and replace of various interesting components. Um, you know, it might actually also be more maintainable and therefore faster to move going forward. So uh, I'm, I'm of the opinion that they've pushed hard for a long time against the leader, and maybe they're at a point where they can make something, you know, they can actually challenge Hotspot directly. Um, I'm, I'm on the sidelines watching. I'm cheering both parties. <laughs> yeah? Uh, so the JVM is not only used by Java anymore, but uh, it's yeah. more, more and more languages. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, apart from, let's say, import dynamic, uh, to what extent is the work on Java performance driven by non-Java languages? Um, so what extent Java performance is driven by non-Java languages? So. Um, you know, Invoke Dynamic was the big one. That was the, the non-Java languages like screaming out for a, a way to do virtual calls with different dispatch semantics. Other things I don't hear a lot of screaming about that are pushing forward. So I mentioned a bunch of things, um, including you know, fixed nums and tail calls and closures um, that have been brought up to me repeatedly both before and after I left the uh, you know, sun about, can't we do something here? And the answer, of course, is it's not too hard to do something. And it would enable you know, uh, you know, fixed nums and big integer enables a Java scripty-like thing. Uh, tail calls go to everyone who's doing true you know, functional programming things. Closures go to everyone who's doing true functional programming-like things. Um, yes, something could be done. There doesn't seem to be enough pressure to make that happen yet. So for the moment, I think Java, you know, internal VM performance is looking in the other direction still. So I know Graal's been a long time project. There's a lot of resources going there. Um, I know that people have tried and experimented with uh, 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 other kinds of, of performance optimizations like the escape analysis, which tried and, and I don't believe found to be very effective, um, but maybe you want to do something else with it. Um, I, I don't know what else is going on in C2 land. I haven't heard from those guys in forever and a day. Um, I did a lot of stuff at Azul that you know, maybe Oracle should or could have copied. 
uh, including, you know, knowing what a new meant and it was unalias to anything else. And I could do a bunch of optimizations around it. Um, I did a bunch of stuff with interfaces and interface optimizations that again, that would require sort of a major C2 replumbing. Um, I don't know, is there anything else going on at the JVM, at the, at the JIT compiler level? So, you know, the, the G1 is a GC thing. There's a giant pile of work going on there. What Azul did for GPGC included uh, replumbing how threads were started and stopped and exceptions were thrown. Um, and that replumbing enabled like a really cheap way to do bias locking, much cheaper than what Oracle ended up with, as well as the ability to stop and start single threads at the you know, nanosecond granularity level. And that turned into what you, know, what you need for a low pause collector. That's something that Sun Oracle ought to be doing. It's not really JIT stuff, but it's certainly JVM performance work. This is like, ask Brian Getz, and I'm sure he'll have an answer for you, is what's going on inside the JVM. There's a lot of work going above it, you know, streams, right? That was all non-JVM stuff. So if I had to ask on, on, you know, thinking through it, streams probably bring up a new coding style for which you want to have certain kind of optimizations done, and you might tweak the compilers to make sure those optimizations happen. So there might have been something done there to make streams go faster, for instance. I know Fork Join went through some round of optimizations of the VM at various levels, because um, you had all kinds of fun games with too many threads or not enough threads and what it meant to do waits or notifies when you had a huge count of threads that were constantly trying to juggle tasks back and forth. Somebody was raising their hand, but maybe they were stretching. Okay. All right, this is a real, real raised hand. Yeah. Uh, do you think Intel's HTM can help performance? Do I think Intel's HTM can help performance? So the HTM has a very small count of of uh, things that you can do atomic updates on. And so it's only gonna apply where you have a small count of things where you can get an atomic update. And that in turn means it's restricted to, um, you know, things that people understand very carefully what it is that can be done atomically and why. And that will in turn probably mean it's best use is to be pickled into a library call to allow some sort of concurrent update on some sort of, you know, shareable structure uh, at, at low cost. Uh, and so that probably means it would make you know, something to do with the JDK locks and the, the try locks and, and reader, writer locks, whatever, do something more efficient. Um, it, you know, it's got to get buried into the library somehow to be useful. Um, that said, you know, we kind of worked out these problems. Like, people screamed at Intel for years on end, and Intel, in its infinite wisdom, stalled on these things for a very long time. And so people worked around it. And now the need for multi-word atomic update is less than it used to be because we now have a better answer in many cases. So I think there's some room there, but I don't know there's a lot of room for performance. Where it might pan out in a sort of a more aggressive way is very specific uh, uh, use cases where I know I want to have multiple cores having very tight coupling. So, you know, not to say high-frequency trading or anything like that, but there's a few domains where people pay big bucks for that but I don't know there's a whole lot of other domains where it's going to matter. There might be something in the OS itself, maybe, when he's doing context switches amongst lots of threads and he has to do a bunch of state changes. Uh, it might work out better. And it might lower context switch costs, maybe. I don't know. That's, that's not a JVM question at all, though. Yeah? Do you think G1 is the way to go and it would be the final table of the next GPGC? No. I thought I said that already. GPGC is GPGC. Azul's GPGC is a much better GC in a lot of ways. It's hugely more performant, hugely lower latency, hugely higher throughput. Like, what the hell? So, you know, having said that, um, I, I fiddled with G1 some years ago, and it was clearly a loser to GPGC, and it was clearly a loser to my use cases where the stock VM, where I was, I was targeting my heap allocation patterns that work well at the stock VM. It's been a few years. Maybe it's better. I could try it again. I haven't. Um, the numbers I hear from Oracle don't look very impressive compared to the numbers I know Azul's getting. I think Google or Oracle should buy Azul tech, shove it into the JVM, and just turn that sucker on as the default, and I think people would jump on it. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't control either one of those, so. Yeah. On Valhalla. Uh, okay, help me out. Which one's Valhalla? Uh, the one with the value types. Oh, value types. 
Oh, okay, value types. Yeah, sure. So um, actually, if I was looking at JVM work that might go somewhere, that has some legs. So what I did at H2O was did essentially value types manually using unsafe and big piles of byte arrays, you know, primitive byte arrays. Um, it's really how do I get rid of the object header on a zillion tiny objects? So if I do capital D double, because I love my hash tables using capital D double keys for whatever reason, um, I end up with, you know, eight bytes of payload and 32 bytes of object word, four to one, like loser ratio. So if I have a billion of these things and a four to one ratio, I, I lose, you know, I, by, by, by four billions or whatever it's going to be, right? A lot. Um, so that lossage turns into allocation time. It turns into memory bandwidth. The caches get smaller by 4x and the whole nine yards, right? There's, there's an actual real cost there. And I say capital DW is sort of a sort of a, obviously like, why would you ever do that? But people do it with point. People will do it with int and long, actually long, without meaning to. It'll happen with autoboxing, for instance. So there's something we said there where you'd like to have a structure which looked like um, you know, a, a full Java object, but you could make an array of a zillion of them and have it you know, be performant uh, without all the overheads. Now, having said that, the way I do that is I rotate my data structures 90 degrees. So if I need to have a zillion tiny objects, instead of having an array of structs, I have a struct of arrays. And you just put accessors to make it transparently behave. You have a two-dimensional structure. It's accessed one way by field name, point me, x, y, and z. The other way by the array index. So you make an accessor that you know, doesn't care which way it goes. And under the hood, you, you flip the thing. And you have a bunch of arrays. And the arrays then have linear striding pattern ac access patterns. They have no headers except one for the array, not one per element, and so on and so forth. So you get all the memory speed out. You get the bandwidth out. You get prefetching from the hardware out. You lose the object headers. You have all the right properties, except you can't take an individual point and move it out of that array and pass it around, which in the Valhalla thing will sort of auto box it, if you will, back to an object and pass it around. Um, for me, if I want to do that, I, I explicitly unbox it or box it, as the case may be. Um, but I get my performance out for these cases where I have large arrays of, of structs. And that's, in fact, what H2O basically does, more or less the, the, the major theme there. All right. I'll be around a while. If people want to talk to me, too embarrassed to talk in, in public, but we'll talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. I'll be here.